I'd like to welcome you all today to today's webinar, 2015 Trends in Independent Educational Consulting. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available within 24 hours. If you registered through Extension's free events website, you will automatically receive an email with a link to the archive. If for some reason you do not receive that email, you can access the recording manually by going to uci.webex.com, clicking on the Event Center tab, and then clicking on View Event Recordings. This presentation would be listed with other recordings, so you would simply need to search for this webinar's title. And again, a majority of you, I believe, have registered through the free events website, so you will automatically receive a link to the webinar recording um, tomorrow. My name is Lisa Kotowaki, and I'm a program manager here at UC Irvine Extension. Here's a brief outline of what we are going to cover today in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features, so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I will be giving you some information about UCI Extension's Independent Educational Consultant Certificate Program, which is a fully online program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and details regarding upcoming courses for our fall quarter, which begins September 21st. I will then turn it over to our guest presenter, Mark Claro, IECA Chief Executive Officer. At the end of Mark's presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send us any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to UCI John and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Mark regarding the content of this presentation, please feel free to submit it in the chat panel and we will address it at the end if we have time. So you'll want to take a look at the, if you're on a PC, you want to take a look at the top of your participant list on the right-hand side of the screen. You should see a row of icons and if it doesn't appear already, you'll want to click on the chat bubble icon and that will make the chat panel appear on your screen. Please be sure to send all questions to all panelists and that'll ensure that all of us receive your question. Um, and again, feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. Um, we will try to leave a few minutes at the end for a brief Q&A session. Uh, if we don't have time, if the webinar runs until the end time, um, I will go ahead and leave my contact information for you so that you can send us any additional questions and we can address them later on. Here is a brief overview of the Independent Educational Consultant Certificate Program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to fully understand the college admissions process and how to meet the needs of varied clients. Developed and taught by industry experts and accomplished educational consultants, you will also acquire the basic skills required to start, open, and expand a successful and ethical educational consulting business. Our program is designed for a number of audiences. Currently, we have individuals who have transitioned into the college admissions consulting profession from other careers, like high school counseling or administration. Individuals looking to develop their business model and marketing plan in order to launch their own private practice. We also have people who are already practicing IECs, but are seeking professional development opportunities. The certificate program is composed of five required courses and two electives, which add up to seven courses or 15 units total. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all seven courses with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed declaration of candidacy. Now, since there is a small candidacy fee, I usually advise students to take a few courses before they apply, just to make sure that they do wanna complete the full program. As I mentioned before, our certificate program consists of seven online courses. The five required courses are listed below. We have Principles of Educational Consulting, Navigating the Financial Aid Network, College Admissions Consulting Resources, Developing an Independent Educational Consulting Business, and the Indi Independent Educational Consulting Practicum. You wanna pay close attention to the unit value of each course, which is listed in parentheses, because this dictates how long each course will last. So for example, you can expect a two unit course to last seven weeks online and a 2.5 unit course to last eight weeks online. 
We highly recommend that new students take the Principles of Educational Consulting course during their first quarter. And there is a prerequisite for the practicum course. You must have completed all other required courses before enrolling in the practicum. We also offer a number of very interesting electives, working with students with learning differences, marketing and PR for the educational consultant, consulting transfer summer and gap year students, and social media for the independent educational consultant, as well as American College Consulting for the international student. Now, because elective courses focus on more specific topics, you'll notice that each elective course has a smaller unit value than the required courses. The electives are 1.5 units and will run for five or six weeks online. In the upcoming fall quarter, we will be offering the following required courses. Principles of Educational Consulting, Navigating the Financial Aid Network, College Admissions Consulting Resources, and Developing an Independent Educational Consulting Business. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $675 per course. Here are the two electives being offered in fall 2015, Consulting Transfer Summer and Gap Year Students, and Social Media for the IEC. Again, the start and end dates of each class are listed as well as the online fee. The course schedule and enrollment information are also posted on our website. Enrollment is currently open and students may enroll either online or by calling our Student Services Office at the number provided on this slide. Courses in the program do fill up pretty quickly, so early registration is recommended. Each course in our program costs $675, so you're looking at $4,725 in course fees for the seven online classes. Now, you don't pay the entire total up front. You would simply pay for each course individually at the time of enrollment. And there is also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program, so in the end, you're looking at a total of $4,850. Please note that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is provided on the enrollment page, so you'll know if any course materials are required before you enroll in a class. And here is a screenshot of the certificate page on our website. There's a lot of information about our program requirements and course offerings on this page, so I do encourage you to visit it. And I just wanted to point out a section that goes over the discount that we provide to members of the IECA. Members are given a 10% discount on courses within UCI Extension's Independent Educational Consultant Certificate Program. And completion of our certificate program also satisfies the experience requirement for associate membership in the IECA. For membership questions or to receive the discount code if you are already a member, please contact the IECA membership office directly. Here is a shot of the cover of our IEC certificate program brochure. If you don't have a brochure, you can also download it off of our website. Similar to the website, the brochure contains just general information about the certificate program, as well as detailed course descriptions. And also I've included a screenshot of our online course grid. When you are viewing the course schedule, you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so you will want to plan accordingly when you're mapping out your course schedule. All right, we are very excited to have Mark with us today to share the 2015 trends in independent educational consulting. He is the current CEO of IECA and has also been an advisory committee member for our certificate program since the very beginning. So at this time, I'd like to hand over the presenter ball to Mark so that he can begin his presentation. Lisa, thanks very much. Uh, one of the things that you're gonna find out very quickly is there's a whole lot of statistics in here. And so when we're done, I'm sure there are people gonna to wanna to print this out and keep some of these statistics with them or refer to them later on. For those of you that are not uh, statistically minded, 
uh, I'll do my best to also paint a picture of what's going on in the profession of consulting. Some of this is the first time we are sort of publicly talking about the results of our 2015 survey of independent educational consultants. We got survey results back from about 500 uh, members of IECA. I know I looked at the attendee list a little while ago and I saw some uh, uh, recent Summer Training Institute folks, uh, which is great. And uh, I want to welcome them in particular and some of the information they see here is going to look pretty familiar. Uh, I know in the past, uh, the good folks at UC Irvine have allowed us to put a copy of the uh, webinar on our website, and I hope that we'll get a chance to do that as well. Uh, in the description uh, of this session, we said, well, everyone knows that the field is growing, uh, but that I really want to talk about how the field is transforming educational counseling for kids. But first I thought, well, I better prove what I said is the truth. So the fact of the matter is, if you look at a 10-year period, the number of educational consultants has grown from about 1,500 people doing it uh, uh, professionally uh, with another 4,000 dabblers, and that's dabblers for me are people, English teachers and math tutors and people who uh, may be in spare time helping a few kids has grown to more like 9,000 uh, people doing this professionally and another 10 to 15,000 dabblers. Uh, and many of you know that to be an IECA, you have got to have been in the field for three years and so much more. Uh, and there's an indication of how quickly suddenly the field is really growing. Uh, so we know that the field is growing. Let's get into what some of those changes are. We're going to both look at some of the macro trends, and for that, I mean, what's going on in the profession uh, as a whole? Uh, as a guy that's been around at IECA for 21 years, uh, I have a fairly good uh, sense of how the field is really growing, uh, probably study it more than anyone else in the country. But I also want to make sure we touch on some micro trends, and what I mean by micro trends What's going on inside an individual consultant's practice? So that's what I want to be uh, talking about. But first, I want to start with the perception of who educational consultants are. Uh, for the last 10 years, 15 years, if you watch the Today Show or you watch Good Morning America, your sense of who an educational consultant is is probably a very uh, wealthy seeming individual from New York City who is serving other wealthy people from New York City. Uh, you hear these ridiculous figures that they charge $60,000 a year to, or $60,000 to work with a family on the placement, or they do a boot camp that costs $26,000 for one week in the summer. These really ridiculous things. And yet, that's what shapes the perception. So the perception, I think, is uh, that educational consultants are primarily located on the coasts and big cities, sort of the Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. corridor, and maybe a bit in uh, L.A., San Francisco, maybe Seattle on the West Coast. Uh, but there's also this sense when I go to NACAC and other places that educational consultants are all wealthy, they're all well off, they only talk about getting kids in and they, they over promise what they can do and they hold kids' hands, you know, kids don't have the chance to really do it on their own, uh, it, it, that, that the consultant uh, serves them and that their client base is very wealthy but that they're also somewhat inexperienced. Uh, there isn't probably a week or two that goes by that I don't read some ridiculous question on the NACAC listserv uh, or the IECA listserv that might suggest a consultant not being uh, very experienced. And probably the worst thing of all is there 
there is that sense. If, who's paying $60,000 for help or $26,000 for a boot camp? Well, it must be pretty well-off families. So it, consultants get that rap that they're helping kids who already have it pretty good. But here's the reality of the research. The, the typical client for an educational consultant is a public school kid. They are probably attending a large suburban school out where I am right here. The closest high school to me has about 4,000 students. Uh, that's a typical kind of place where a consultant might be hired, although it's becoming more and more diverse. Uh, the consultants that attended our summer training institute, and particularly last week in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, it was an incredibly diverse group of individuals serving all sorts of communities. It is interesting to note what's on the right side of your screen here, and that is that while 28% of families that work with consultants really are a wealthier class, uh, from upper class socioeconomically, uh, almost an equal number, 26% uh, of those client families uh, are working lower middle class or actually impoverished. And, and we're going to get a little bit more into that as we go through. So the sense that this is only serving wealthy kids uh, it is ridiculous. And you're going to see how many more of those myths really uh, bite the dust as we go along. Uh, notice also that that, uh, that rap that consultants sometimes get, that, oh, they only work a few hours a week and they're sort of dabbling in the field. Well, we looked at IECA professional members and three quarters of them are working full time, another 5% are getting close. And as many people on this call know, because I looked at the list, most of you are consultants or heading in that direction, you know that consultants are largely working late afternoons and evenings. That's when kids are available. 60% seeing kids on Saturdays and 48% seeing kids on Sundays. And they may not be working all day Saturday and Sunday, but boy, that's not a part-time dabbler. That's somebody very committed to their field and serving kids when they need to be served. In addition, for those who say, oh, but educational consultants don't have the breadth of experience, you know, that's true. A consultant can just hang out a shingle and nothing stops someone. Uh, you know, there's the proverbial uh, mom who says, well, I got my daughter into Bryn Mawr. Now I want to do that for everyone else. And, and the fact of the matter is, when people call us and, and very sincerely say that to us, the answer I give them is spend a year visiting college campuses and then we'll talk. Or attend the Summer Training Institute that IECA offers or attend the UCI courses. So, but you can see here that if you look at the average independent educational consultant in our survey had 12 years working in private practice and more than 20 years, or almost 20 years, working in the area of uh, counseling or, or college admission. That is unbelievable breadth of experience that educational consultants have that can really make a difference. But, and, and let me say this, that one of the ways the field has really changed is that we, although accused of emphasizing getting in, anybody in there who's an IECA know that we look at websites when you try to join the association. If that's your interest, we toss you. We don't accept you as a member of the association. We want it to be on great fit. And the proof, the, the statistical way of proving that is look at the percentage of members that are doing other sorts of work. It used to be that only about a quarter of our members did career. It's now at 55%. 84% are working on academic course selection with families. And you can see the other numbers there. 43% doing financial aid is double what it was about three or four years ago. So it is uh, a, a much fuller form of advising uh, than simply uh, the, the wrap on consultants that they're just about getting people in. 
And there's one thing that I want to say, and, and, and I'm going to do it by way of a short story. I attended the last two uh, conferences at the Western ACAC. And uh, in 2014, there was a, a meeting of, of like-employed people, and you'll know what I mean in a second, in three rooms. And I walked by the first room, and it was about a hundred there were about a hundred and twenty people in that room that were private school counselors, so about a hundred and twenty in that room. The next room was uh, for independent educational consultants, and there were about a hundred and thirty people in that room, uh, maybe a little bit more. I sort of lost count, but I wanted to go and look in the last room, which was for public school counselors. The number of people in that room, 11 sitting in a small circle, virtually every school district in America has stopped the training of, of college counselors. They simply can't afford to do it. They can't afford to let them out of the building. They can't afford, uh, meaning to go visit campuses. They can't afford to let them go to training programs. And they have bigger and bigger caseloads. And if it weren't for independent educational consulting. I think the kids we'd be leaving behind are public school kids because those private school kids would get the help that they need. Uh, others would, would get help uh, as they need it because they're hiring independently. But I am very worried and I continue to be worried about public school students and whether they're gonna be able to in the future get the help they need just a couple of three quick facts that I have up there. I think we all know that it, this recommended student counselor ratios, which are recommended to be about 250 to one, are now uh, close to double that nationally and almost and about more than four times that in California. And California often sets the trend for the rest of the country. The number in the middle I've been talking about for a couple of years since this research been has been done by the uh, American School Counselors Association. In four years, the average student gets 38 minutes of college counseling, or about 10 minutes a year. And in fact, 60% of kids say that they haven't received any college counseling at all. And that's why I think that the field of educational consulting is growing and holds great hope uh, for what's going to happen. So let's go to some of the things that we discovered in our survey. First, uh, we asked uh, members if they set a maximum for their practice and whether they reached it. And 60% said they reached their maximum. That number has not even been close to 50% in the past. That is a huge increase. And we asked, has the change in the number of clients that you've had over the last two years has that increased significantly, which we defined as more than 25%, moderately up to 25%, or no change? Virtually no one in the survey said that there's been a decline in the number of clients, except for those who said they've become part-time, they wanted to, to move slower, close down their practice. So consultants are seeing more kids than they've ever seen before, and some of the impact of that we're going to see uh, in just a couple of minutes. So uh, a couple of other things about our practice, and it's one of the significant ways that IECs are different than school-based counselors. On average, 19 evaluative visits uh, last year. Another way that the practice is changing for educational consultants uh, is the growing work that's being done uh, with students globally. Notice 14% of our members uh, said that they, uh, that they work with a significant number, but I think this is the more interesting number. This 39% who work with small numbers of global students, that's a number that used to be under 10% and has very quickly grown to 39%. So what we are seeing is more and more consultants are working with whoever comes along, not just local students, which was always sort of the bread and butter of consulting that you would work with a kid locally, but now working with kids wherever they are. And one of the ways we see that playing out 
in one of the most significant changes. I remember a debate in IECA's Board of Directors maybe 15 years ago. Should IECA require that every consulting session be done face-to-face? -face? That it was considered to be so significant to be sitting across the room with someone every single time. Now, 62% of our members say they at least do some distance consulting, whether that's a kid sitting in the hallway of school or that's something else going on. Uh, most are saying uh, that they do some uh, uh, work with families uh, electronically or, or using uh, some other some other form of, uh, uh, of ability to work with families outside of their immediate area. Uh, I also wanted to point out uh, that there's about 6% there in that bottom line, about 6% of our folks down here that are basically saying they never see their clients in person. Uh, but rather they're using uh, 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 technology in order to connect with, with kids. Moving on, uh, some other ways that practices have changed, and this is pretty dramatic. Just a few years ago when asked, I would indicate uh, that 90% of consultants work in an individual practice. They work for themselves, whether in an office building or at their kitchen table uh, or at the local Starbucks, but they worked personally all alone. Today, it's almost half work in a multi-person practice. That's because of the growth that I showed you a few slides earlier that said that, that oh, almost half have seen dramatic increases. And if you want to continue to have your practice succeed and thrive and grow, most people have discovered you can add someone to your practice. And it is a great way not only to expand uh, the geographic footprint of a practice, but consultants are discovering that they're able to, um, uh, they're able to, uh, uh, serve kids, maybe someone's an LD expert, someone's a student athlete expert, and serve kids in new and creative ways. I also have a few other numbers there that just show how professionally different the consulting field is than it was just a few years ago. Almost no one used to incorporate or use contracts uh, or carry liability insurance. Now every, almost everyone is doing at least a couple of those. Uh, certainly almost everybody using a, a contract today. 78% using social media. We might get a little bit more into that. And I think it's interesting that 64% use a data management system because they didn't exist for consultants five years ago. Now they not only exist, and here I mean College Planner Pro, Guided Path, uh, consultants using other systems as well. Now. 64% using a data management system is a pretty remarkable number. Uh, there you can see a, a little bit more detail on how the businesses has, have really changed, and it's, it's pretty much just giving you statistics to back up the information I gave you earlier. Here, it's going to be a little interesting what I want to talk about here. You can see that 95% say they work for profit. Mostly it's for their own business. This is imp really interesting information. That was 2% two, two years ago. And I know you might be thinking, yeah, from 2% to 5%, is that not a big deal? There isn't a business in America or profession that wouldn't think a 150% increase in the number of people doing something wasn't major. And now we see a growing number of IECA members who either form their own nonprofit or go to work for a community-based organization, working for some other educational organization. We get phone calls from community organizations all the time talking to us about the fact that their kids 
think of, of Girl Scouts of America, other organizations where their kids aren't getting counseling. And they want to know what they can do to help promote counseling uh, among their, their own uh, kids that are involved in their program. Now, I said we were going to talk about fees, so we are going to talk about fees. Uh, and knowing we've got mostly consultants here, but we want to ha share some interesting information for you. Uh, yes, most educational consultants have a package. Uh, almost 100% of our members said that they charge with an entire package of services that's comprehensive. But 90% now say they have smaller, less costly options. And as the field grows, we're seeing more and more creative packaging of consultant services. We see more and more people offering it in different ways to make it more affordable to that middle class community that I said really dominates the use of consultants today. And if you look at where those are, mostly it's hourly. Uh, rates. But I'll tell you, at the Summer Training Institute, there was a lot of talk about smaller plans, not dealing with essays and interviews and all of that, but concentrating on the development of lists. Uh, others have a la carte services. If you want them to do a Myers-Briggs, they can do that. But it's not included for everyone. Uh, they can do a strong interest inventory or a youth science, or they can do something else with careers. So there's lots of, of things out there that consultants can do and new ways of doing it. But of course, we're pretty proud of that number at the very bottom, where almost every IECA member and almost every consultant I know is giving pro bono help as well. Last, before I say something about actual numbers, uh, let me point out uh, that uh, it, if you think of the fact we have said forever that it takes about three years to establish a consulting practice, the first three years are a little tough, yet even those with, with under three years experience, we used to show that 75% uh, that of them had losses in the first three years. That's down to 27%. Uh, most people are able to become profitable within a year of setting up a consulting practice. Those with three years or more, that's a remarkable number that 88% saw profit. We know that we live in an era where three quarters of businesses go bankrupt in the first five years. And yet after three years, most of our members are, are doing pretty well. And interesting, if we were to look in different communities, that includes smaller communities as well as bigger ones. Uh, we all know some of the, the consultant who has the largest practice in the United States is in West Virginia. And that certainly says something about the ability to create a successful consulting practice almost anywhere. The two things most important about establishing that practice in, in, within three years, one is the quality of advising. That's absolutely key. And the second is to exceed client expectations. And I included that especially for the STI folks. So let me go back to our consultant that was featured on Today Show or Good Morning America and was probably charging $60,000. The fact is most educational consultants not only charge less than that, they charge a tenth of that for up to three years of advising. At very few members uh, who filled out their surveys for us said that they were charging over $10,000 for a multi-year contract. That simply is just this fiction created based on, I think, who can afford to hire a full-time PR director. So they, they get them on TV and, and, and all the stuff that comes with that. Uh, so where are consultants right now, what are they charging? Well, about half charge between three and 6,000 a year. The difference is almost entirely between those on the East Coast in those big cities where it's closer to that $6,000 figure uh, versus uh, more rural, uh, Midwestern, Southern communities 
where it's closer to 3,000 or 3,500. Uh, but the mean, the national average, is now 4,620. And that's a good number to hold on to. So write that down somewhere off to the side, 4,620, because I'm about to show you some big variances there. Uh, one variance is how much experience. If you have more than three years' experience, you are probably 10% over that amount that we just said to write down 4,620 or 11% below that if you have under three years. International folks, 40% above, spelled in a very interesting way, I just noticed, uh, 4,620. In New England, it's 15% above. Uh, Mid-Atlantic is close to the average. Midwest, West, and South are all a little bit below. Midwest, of course, that should be a percentage sign after the 11. Uh, let me just say this. It, 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 this can give you a rough number. If you start out, if you tell me I am an educational consultant working in uh, Los Angeles, uh, what I would say is, well, at, you have more than three years' experience. Well, the more than three years' experience uh, is going to give you uh, is going to give you 10% above average. Uh, and then working in the West is going to give you 14% below. So you start plugging in the numbers and you get a sense of what a consultant in your community is charging. We actually have a lot of data that we'll be coming out with soon about different parts of the country, big cities, and others to give our members a sense of what that median is that would be comparable to where they are now. So leaving money behind for a second. Uh, let's move on to some other areas that I find really interesting. Uh, students of consultants change uh, the way they behave. Uh, nationwide, 20% of kids uh, go out of state. Of those working with a consultant, three and a half times as many uh, go out of state. And because we can control for family income, this is not a function of who can afford to go and pay out-of-state tuition. It's a function of learning about options that are available. And what's fascinating is, as the number of kids going out of state, as the number of kids going to private colleges has continued to decline over the last few years because of the economy, it has not declined at all among those working with consultants. And I just mentioned it, so let's take a look at those going to private colleges. Four times as many of those kids who work with an educational consultant go to an independent college. Uh, that, that's a pretty remarkable number. So let's take a minute to start looking about how some of the changes are taking place. And I'll try to do this in five minutes, and then I can answer any questions you've got. So first. Uh, the question is how things are changing for independent educational consultants in their own practice. The first is just a plethora of training opportunities that simply didn't exist a few years ago. UC Irvine, of course, is, is, is one. With an IECA, our conferences twice a year, webinars 12 a year, the retreats that we do, we're now doing regional events, not only are regional groups meeting, uh, some of them monthly, some of them bi-monthly, uh, but we've also begun to do these symposia around the country with admission directors. Uh, in addition, we are now entering uh, a phase where we're looking at offering certi certificates for completion of certain training programs, Myers-Briggs or gap year programs or understanding the British educational system, there's just so many more opportunities to learn, uh, get new knowledge, learn new skills uh, as an educational consultant more than there ever used to be. The thing that I immediately uh, called the IECA board president uh, last week when I was at our summer training institute because I was so excited to see that the profession, those coming into the profession are beginning to look more like America, reflecting socioeconomic and cultural diversity, 
in pretty significant ways. That is both gender diversity, which was not always a strength of those in this particular profession, uh, but also increasing numbers of folks who are uh, Spanish speaking, increasing numbers of folks who are African American. Just, it, w it was exciting to see that kind of diversity as well as the diversity of where people come from within the United States and beyond. Uh, the number of international attendees last week dramatically higher. And for me, that's usually a good judge of where's the profession going is to look at who came to the IECA Summer Training Institute. I talked about this office management system. There are so many coming along, but new products coming along. Curricula for the, for the educational consulting office and so many other new things. Uh, and the reason this is such an exciting development, there was a reason that no one was developing these products 10 years ago. There weren't enough consultants. You didn't have enough people to sell to. So you could develop a product, but to sell to what? Maybe 50 or 60 or 80 or 100 people? It just wasn't cost effective. Now as this field is growing so quickly, it has become cost effective to, to do those sorts of uh, product development uh, that's so necessary. Another trend going on is how increasingly specialized consulting practices are. Uh, I know a number of people that only work on placement of kids in small Christian colleges. I know a number of people that only do LD placements uh, as it relates to college. I know some people are experts at sports and at arts who know how to do an art portfolio. Uh, although this one looks like a physical portfolio, they understand that the times have changed and most portfolios are now done electronically these days. So that increasing specialization is, I think, going to really stand families very well to find out somebody who knows how to work with somebody like them. There's also, we talked about that consultants are doing more, and now increasingly I see consultants involved in summer and gap year doing work with groups as well as individuals. Uh, but an interesting one that I'm just beginning to see really emerge is this parent education. Uh, that consultants feel it is in part their responsibility uh, to help parents get ready for their kids being away, to understand how things are going to change for them, to understand how little parents can influence what happens for kids once they leave. Uh, so I see that increasingly, and there's no question that the other area uh, that we're seeing dramatic change take place is here in the area of affordability, uh, that consultants increasingly are being called on to know more and do more in terms uh, of how kids can afford colleges. You know, one of the other ways that things have really changed is that I would say 20 years ago when I started, 80% uh, of college admissions offices said that they wouldn't talk to or work with educational consultants. 10 years ago, that was probably down to 40%. Today, I can almost count on my fingers and toes the number of colleges that will say they don't work with educational consultants. The fact is virtually all colleges do. They understand that we're the ones that diversify their campus. Uh, I have heard college reps present to their colleagues, and they specifically mention IECA members and, and ed consultants generally as the way that their college has become a more diverse place because they're drawing kids from outside of their region. So it, it, is, uh, it is one of the keys to what makes educational consulting effective. The other thing is, you know, we've talked about uh, the issue of fit. I, I think a lot of people don't know that if you went back and looked at the literature, the only ones using the phrase fit, college fit, about 20 years ago were IECs. They were members of IECA. We introduced the phrase. Uh, we were the ones using it. We were the ones saying how important it was. And so, uh, 
that now has become the standard is to think about fit. But it also is important to emphasize that one of the ways the field overall is changing is most people now agree with us. It isn't about getting in, it's about an ideal fit. And uh, I, I was talking to uh, uh, Brent Benner from the University of Tampa, and he was saying what he really appreciated was that consultants were becoming more knowledgeable about financial fit. And that meant that if a consultant said to a family to look at the University of Tampa, they knew what the cost was, they understood, they understood how merit aid worked, they understood how other forms of financial aid work. So all very positive uh, to hear that. One of the things I've been talking about for a couple years is this one. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a time five years ago when no one knew what to call us. And there were people out there saying, well, I'm an independent. Well, an independent what? Uh, or that I'm a college coach or I'm a college advisor. And today, almost universally accepted, in part thanks to UC Irvine developing an independent educational consultant certificate program, thanks to IECA, we have really fought to make sure that we all use the same name. If you want to know the level of success, it is dramatic. NACAC now uses IEC, Independent Educational Consultant, as the phrase of choice. If you look at Google searches in this whole area of college admissions and trying to hire a private consultant, the majority of those searches now use Independent Educational Consultant. As a phrase, it has become more and more well known. So let me say to those of you that are out there that are calling yourself something else, and that's fine, but you're not going to be found as people do Google searches because increasingly the search that, that they're doing on Google, Google is for an independent educational consultant. So uh, there's, there's some quick contact uh, information for those that may want to be in touch with me uh, or someone here at the office. Uh, and uh, we're more than happy to, to get information out to you, give you more details. In fact, IECA will be doing in December uh, with a bit more detail on some of the numbers uh, for our members and, and, and uh, a little bit uh, more detailed look. Uh, and uh, we'll see when that uh, when that comes up, we'll certainly be letting people know about that. Uh, but I know I just threw a ton of numbers at you, uh, and I can't believe I'm sort of that I that I was able to squeeze it all in. Anybody that knows me know that that's atypical. Uh, but I'm happy to to respond to any questions that anyone may have. Uh, about anything that you saw today. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. And it was a jam-packed information, but I think it was very helpful for everybody logged in. And I don't know if you want to take a few minutes, Mark. You may have received some questions while you were presenting. So if you want to take a few minutes to just go through your chat panel or scroll up to see if somebody may have asked you something during the presentation that you now would uh, like to address. Well, the first I, I was asked, uh, somebody wanted to know, uh, you know, I showed what membership in the association at the very beginning, I showed how the field has grown, what do I believe is going to happen over the next three to five years? And the answer is, I actually think the field is going to about double in size in the next five years. I mean, that's going to be remarkable. Uh, IECA's membership now almost 1,500, I think will be a 3,000, I think that there'll be uh, maybe as many as 15,000 people doing this kind of work. There's so many reasons behind that, economic reasons, school districts laying off counselors, kids then can't get great uh, counseling. Uh, so um, I, I, that's the answer to that question, and that's my best guess is what's happening on membership. Uh, I see from Kathy uh, there was a question uh, about the comprehensive fee in per information, uh, wanting to know what those above and below, that this area is 15% more and experience 10% more, do you keep adding them all together? And the answer is yes. 
So if you've been at it for more than three years, it goes up 10%, I think it was, uh, and then if you're from New England, it's 15%, so altogether you're at about 25% more. Uh, so you, you do add all those numbers up together. I will tell you that those people that work in highly specialized areas, uh, there was a question sent privately to me, meaning someone who does LD or somebody who's working in a highly specialized part of athletics or something else, do those people tend to charge more? And the answer is yes, again. Uh, and that's why I want to get some more detail uh, brought out from the surveys. We're so thankful. And everyone says if you get like about a 5% return rate on surveys, you should be happy. And our return rate was more like 35 to 40%. So we're able to really make use of those figures and, and get a sense of uh, what people are charging in the country. So those are the, those are the questions I think I got myself. Uh, I have an, actually another just came through. Uh, yeah, the question I think is, do members charge the same package rate 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, or does it depend on when the family starts? What most consultants say is they charge the same package fee regardless of where a student starts. And the theory behind that is if a student, take a student in 10th grade who gets started. Uh, you have the luxury of two years of working with that student, doing interest inventory, looking at careers, and, and other sorts of things. If a student comes to you at the end of 11th grade, chances are you want to do the same amount of work with them, but in a more compressed environment. So most will charge the same. Uh, one of my, the favorite things that I know, um, an outstanding consultant in Philadelphia, uh, uh, Joan Coven uh, says that she developed what she calls her senior rush package. And it's when someone comes to them like now whose kid is a rising senior. And what she says is it's the same amount of money. And I have to work so much more intensely uh, with that family uh, that it only makes sense that we're going to to have to charge them the same amount of money, they're going to require more of my time. And so that's generally what we see, uh, is that most are charging a package rate and it stays the same. Um, I'm looking at one uh, that was just done as an open question. Uh, yeah, the, the question about the contract. Let me say a couple of quick words about what's going to be in the contract. The contract has to have a couple of key pieces. Uh, a contract should always have the start date. It should have an end date. Are you working with the family until they start at college, or do you work, are you their consultant if things don't work out well? Uh, so you need that. I think the most important piece of the contract is not only what's expected of you in exchange for a particular fee, what do you expect of the family? My guess is you expect the kid to do assignments as they're, as they're assigned in a timely fashion. You expect the parents to be forthcoming with all the information you need to make a, a great uh, set of recommendations. Uh, so it's mostly about getting as much said up front from the beginning and don't leave things to, uh, to chance. Uh, there will be some of that addressed in UCI courses. And in IECA, we did some of that at our Summer Training Institute. We do an entire uh, session, a long session, on legal liability issues that everyone that takes it is a little anxious before it starts, and then we quickly realize it's mostly about how to in ensure great communication so the problems don't develop. So. Uh, you'll get lots of help and, by the way, those that go to our Summer Training Institute, and I'm guessing who take coursework in UCI, you get a 300-page oh, uh, training book from us that includes sample contracts. You are welcome. <laughs> Wonderful. 
We've reached the end time of the webinar today, but Mark, I want to first off thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule. I know that things have been very busy, which is a good thing for IECA, but we love having you present on this topic because it gives all of us um, some helpful insights into the trends and the status of the profession and the industry right now. So thank you, thank you again so much for um, taking time out of your schedule for this webinar. Thank you, Lisa. Always my pleasure to, uh, to be able to be part of things. Great. And for all of you that are logged in, if you do have any questions, if you think of any after the webinar today, please feel free to send them our way. Um, if you send them, email them to me, I can always forward them on to Mark to see if we can get you an answer. And for those of you who register through the free events website, again, you will automatically receive a recording link. Um, so I know the presentation was full of great information, statistics, charts, data. So if you are interested in re-watching it again, which many of you I'm sure are, you will receive that recording link um, by tomorrow. So thank you again, if, everybody. Oh, go ahead, Mark. I was just going to say, and if questions come up as you're watching it a second or third time, what could be better than watching a session with me two or three times? My gosh. Uh, it's more fun than the Republican debates tonight. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if you have any questions that come up after, just send them to send them uh, through Lisa and the link or to me, and I'm more than happy to help. Wonderful. And if any of you logged in have any questions about our certificate program as well, feel free to email me. If you have any questions about you know any IECA upcoming events or conferences, their website is great, and a ton of information is posted on there as well. So. Um, hopefully all of you enjoyed the webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will be in touch. Thanks again, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.